So, uh, Tom Kelly has been a speaker for the past six years at our conference. So this is, I think, conference number four. Uh, he is a board certified both pediat pediatrician, general pediatrician, hence my mm. quick consult here. Uh, he is also board, board certified in pediatric endocrinology. He's been practicing endocrinology now for 15 years. Uh, I can tell you firsthand he is passionate about teaching medical students and residents. Uh, he is blessed with the support of his wife, Vanessa, who I didn't know is one of our nutritionists at Radies. Yeah, does she does. work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I hope I haven't said anything incriminating. <laughs> <laughs> um, he loves the outdoors, anything involving Star Wars, and values every moment of time that he has to spend with his two sons, Devin and Max. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> And I think you are good to go here. So yes, I'm just going to move this over. All right. So uh, thank you again for, for having me up here. And although, yes, I've been up here before talking about endocrinology with Jacobson syndrome, I always try to make things a little bit different and also to try to make things very um, much up to date. So uh, and also, too, during the time when we're when we're up here, I, I don't like to to make things so formal, like I'm standing up here and we have to wait to the end to ask questions and things. So if you have a question or thoughts or an experience, uh, just like what we just did right there, that was a wonderful you know, sharing of information and everything with that. Um, because I think really what, and that's what I really love about coming over here and doing this is it just, I think we're, we're, we just need to stick all together and really help each other out. And that's really where I've also directed a lot of this talk or how I've uh, kind of put together this talk. It's more of empowering families. And, uh, and just like with the medical students, I'm doing the teaching and the residents uh, and the fellows. But also though too, especially with the families, um, that they really get a good understanding of endocrinology uh, to the point where they could really be like an endocrinologist for their for their for their kid, and so that really is a good advocate. So because we know as parents, a lot of times we really have to kind of direct uh, the visit sometimes with the with the physician and really see it's like oh my gosh, is this a referral or not? And and really what kind of assessment was really done? Um, so the first just no financial relationship. <laughs> Sometimes you almost wish that you had. Hmm? <laughs> and there with it, I know. <laughs> but um, so one of the things I wanted just to start off with is growth. Because a lot of times, and, and after a lot of these sessions, you know, families will email me or contact me and they say, we have a question about growth. We have a question of whether or not we're really being assessed properly for growth. And uh, do we have a hormone deficiency or, or is there a way that you can really help identify that? And there have been identified cases of growth hormone deficiency, thyroid hormone deficiency um, with, with children with Jacobson syndrome. And uh, then we're going to kind of be able to see where that plays a role with us in assessing our kids and really um, having us be able to care for them and uh, to, to really work with everything for their overall, for their potential for growth and just living life and just getting the most out of everything. So when you were looking at, at uh, this, I put in these growth charts out, and this mainly is because a lot of times people are like, well, thyroid, I mean, what the heck is that? And if you Google that, it's like one of those things, the commercials at the end, uh, at the end of one of those commercials for a uh, pharmaceutical company, it's like if your child or this person has da -da 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 -da, a huge list of things, well, thyroid is like that. It affects so many different areas of our bodies and uh, Overall, you can kind of summarize it by saying metabolism, but then really kind of what really is that? It does have a very significant impact on growth. And there have been children that have been identified with hypothyroidism with Jacobson syndrome. And actually, hypothyroidism has more of a profound effect on growth than growth hormone deficiency. And so we, we look at these different growth charts, you can see this individual, and these are not children with Jacobson syndrome, I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of just what we're looking at when we're seeing growth hormone deficiency, decreasing percentiles, uh, this is height on the top and weight on the bottom. So despite normal weight gain, and typically um, a lot of the uh, kids with growth hormone deficiency have normal weight gain, but despite that have decreasing percentiles in stature. Same kind of thing that we see with, um, with uh, hypothyroidism. 
And uh, the reason why the growth charts look a little bit different on this uh, more pink one over here, the hypothyroidism that I'm pointing at now, is because these are the uh, ones, the growth charts of birth to uh, two years, or um, in some of the older growth charts that we used with the CDC instead of the WHO, or birth to 36 months. And the reason why I pointed that out is because central hypothyroidism, or being born with hypothyroidism, um, has been identified with Jacobson syndrome. So it's not something that you would uh, need necessarily to wait longer to see that growth deficiency uh, or that decrease in percentiles uh, like we typically see with growth hormone deficiency where we could see that the, the kid was doing well, this is starting at two years of age and then falling off later because your body does use other hormones outside of growth hormone to help grow up until around three years of age. So if we were to meet a family and their, their kid had growth hormone deficiency, if we were to look at that person's growth chart probably up to about, about age two or three, they would probably be growing at a normal growth rate, then fall down after that. And so that's one of the telltale signs or one of the indications that there might be a growth hormone deficiency problem. So a review of um, the literature in the past, or a review, actually it was a review with, with kids, uh, nine children, uh, uh, was part of that review of the literature. And, and eight of nine kids had small or, or short stature or poor growth. Um, but four of these eight kids had low growth hormone levels. And one, uh, three were actually low for age, and one actually was low for a stage in puberty. So pubertal hormones increase growth hormone. That's why we get a growth spurt during the time when we're in puberty. And so sometimes if you're experiencing a low growth hormone level during puberty, that's a relative growth hormone deficiency, and that's significant because you might not experience a growth spurt. So sometimes we don't even identify people until later on once they're in puberty. And that's also uh, really important to point out because a lot of times you'll hear, and even in the, our little endocrine world, you'll hear the endocrinologist say, oh, once you're in puberty, then you can't do anything about growth, or it's too late. You need to do everything before, and that's not true, okay? Um, and as we get a little bit better, uh, we be more through these slides, you'll see what I mean with that, that we do have time to work with. And I've had people that started on growth hormone well into puberty, and we've been able to really uh, help them out, you know, if they've been identified with growth hormone deficiency. Um, with hypothyroidism, uh, this was with another review, 52 cases, central hypothyroidism was identified. So, and I, I highlighted central hypothyroidism because, I think, <laughs> What, it, what exactly is central? When, when, uh, when we're talking central hypothyroidism, it's usually what we're talking about is with the brain. So now, uh, in your brain, you end up having, uh, I'll just jump up to this and I'll come right back to that. Uh, in the very middle of your brain, very middle, all the way across, is the pituitary gland. It releases a lot of different hormones, and one of the hormones is growth hormone. Another hormone is thyroid stimulating hormone, telling the thyroid gland to to make enough thyroid hormone. So if you have a deficiency in that TSH, a deficiency in the hormone uh, from your brain telling your thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone, that's what we term central hypothyroidism. So now you can already see that we might have a little bit of a connection here in the pituitary gland releasing or not releasing enough growth hormone or TSH resulting in central hypothyroidism and event essentially poor growth. Uh, moreover, constipation often is uh, a uh, presenting complaint of hypothyroidism, um, has been found in almost half of children with 11Q or, or Jacobson syndrome, and uh, constipation is, ex is uh, extremely common in babies and children with other chromosome abnormalities as well, and remedies as well as you know, what we use for other children, just like when we talked about like with the nosebleeds, what we can use. Uh, what we recommend with other children um, outside of even having Jacobson syndrome, you know the the you know the Vaseline and the, and the areas of just trying to uh, ensure or decrease the frequency of the bleeds. Um, these are things that are helpful too. Uh, so for uh, children with Jacobson syndrome, if they do have constipation, fluid, fiber, um, and uh, sometimes exercise also helps to kind of get the bowels moving there with it. So uh, these are some indications, not just poor growth, uh, indications that uh, we really want to look at, at thyroid levels. 
um, in our children just to make sure that we're, our levels are sufficient. So are there any other midline defects or essential defects? And it, I mentioned that the pituitary gland is in the midline and we do see, right, a lot of the children have cardiac defects and these defects can be midline. So it already starts to maybe make us suspicious a little bit of uh, uh, any connection between that chromosomal um, abnormality or identify you know, if there's any type of uh, midline defect with our kids. Um, and then the other uh, to, to consider that might be associated with perhaps a midline defect is low gonadotropin. So gonadotropin is like, this is FSH, LH. These are hormones that are coming from the pituitary gland going now to the testes or the ovaries. And if you have a deficiency in these, then this could delay or uh, prevent uh, pubertal development. Um, but in utero, this also can uh, uh, limit or, or affect the descent of the testes. And cryptorchidism is something that uh, we, we can see with children with uh, Jacobson syndrome a little bit more frequently than the general population. And in this one study, uh, and that was the same study we had of the nine children, that eight of them were of smaller stature. Four um, out of the six males of that study, or 67%, had cryptorchidism, which is a potential sign of this hypogonadism or decreased FSH or LH levels. Um, and um, uh, so when we're looking at with Jacobson syndrome, they do have an increased risk of being born with undescended testes. And this is something that can be uh, corrected. It can be something that where the testes can be assisted to be brought down either hormonally with sometimes we'll use a hormone like HCG or human gonadotropin human chorionic gonadotropin, or what we could do also is surgically, they can be placed down there with orchopexy. And, um, and this is something also that is uh, newer, uh, is uh, we, we now know that we have a little bit more time to work with to pull those testes down. In the past, we really wanted to ensure that they were down within maybe the first couple of years or so, and now up until around the time of puberty, if the testes are retractile coming up and down in the scrotum or out above, um, the, the body to uh, above or within you know the inguinal canal, uh, then uh, we can actually wait to uh, work with those uh, kids and bring the testes down a little bit later. Um, and this is according to um, the American Academy of Pediatrics as well as the uh, Association uh, for Physicians, uh, urologists that, that do the surgical procedure. So what little information we do have, and uh, it does seem that puberty does per, uh, proceed normally, um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about puberty and uh, in our following talk in our breakout session, just following this. Um, uh, but along the lines of uh, puberty, uh, I did want to bring out that because when we were talking about this, like with the bleeding disorder with the nosebleeds, then periods can sometimes be a concern for our girls. And if it does seem to be a concern where the periods are very heavy or we're worried about uh, bleeding and prolonged periods, very heavy uh, periods, uh, that's something that you can work with with either the pediatrician or with um, endocrinology. Um, and uh, more recently, a lot of uh, institutions have been uh, getting pediatric gynecologists that can also help out with this too. Um, and this is something that's uh, uh, probably uh, just really also important to touch on is that um, if any type of pharmacologic intervention such as birth control was uh, um, uh, thought to be part of the plan, uh, certain um, uh, uh, insurances um, will require that prescription to be either from an endocrinologist or a gynecologist as opposed to a pediatrician. So something also then to discuss with your, your regular doctor with. Uh, so in other words, it might actually require a referral uh, just to get that under control. But hopefully we don't have to uh, experience that, but that's just something just to bring out. I just wanted to bring that up in here. Now I did say that most of the time it does seem that puberty does progress normally, but just in 2015 there was a case report of a child with Jacobson syndrome uh, that did have precocious or early puberty. So this is puberty happening a bit too soon. So the cutoff ages we now uh, have is typically um, under seven is what we say would be a little bit too soon. I think as a parent we'd say that would be very too soon for, for girls. 
but um, for boys, we, we typically uh, hang out um, age age nine, and that's for true puberty or puberty beginning. Um, one to two years before the onset of real puberty, you can have uh, uh, hair development, body odor, or pimples, and this is usually from the adrenal glands, which embryologically were derived from similar tissues from the testes, or that would make the testes or the ovaries, and sometimes they get revved up a little bit earlier, something that does not usually affect anything else other than just make our kids more hairy and pimply and smelly. But it's uh, not true puberty with that. Um, but in this certain uh, circumstance in here, uh, this uh, uh, girl actually uh, was making too much of these androgens. And so this did affect things such as increased hair growth on her face. Also, it, it uh, resulted in clitoromegaly or enlargement of her clitoris. Um, also, that those hormone levels, the increase in the hormone levels, uh, were uh, causing a little more insulin resistance and uh, development of type 2 diabetes. And the connection that you would look at with those hormone levels in type 2 diabetes, another way of looking at that is, is during pregnancy when we're being monitored for sugar levels, gestational pregnancy-induced diabetes, uh, and that's uh, because those hormone levels, just like this, or the same hormones that we have for puberty, are increasing during that time, causing a little bit more insulin resistance. And so those hormone levels being a little bit elevated in this patient, um, which were measured uh, in this uh, report, uh, did identify that uh, there was a, a setup uh, for uh, not only then insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, she also was identified later as having irregular periods. And sometimes those irregular periods uh, can result in very heavy periods, and you can see now this combination is, is not a favorable combination, right? for someone with Jacobson syndrome, and so she needed some extra help there. So um, why is puberty even important? Why am I even really bringing this up? It has to do more with growth, and if we do look at the bones that are growing, you can see that there is an area over here by arrows that this is a growth plate. So this is not a fracture. This is an area that if you looked under a microscope, you would see that there are cells uh, in there that are cartilage cells, and that's where the growth hormone and thyroid hormone act to make more of those cells expand that growth plate out so that makes it wider, so the bone is then taller, so the person is then taller. Um, and uh, the cells on either side change that cartilage into bone, and so eventually those two areas touch. And what causes those uh, cells to be changed into bone is estrogen dependent. Um, and so uh, guys, as well as uh, uh, our girls, get their estrogen from testosterone. So although the hormones sound very different, they're actually very structurally similar. Just flip around a couple chemical bonds and then you have, instead of testosterone, estradiol, which is the more potent estrogen that we have for us as people. And so that conversion from testosterone to estrogen affects our growth plates. And uh, you can see how hormone levels then can influence this. And that's why during the time of puberty, uh, then our growth plates are closing up. And toward the end of puberty, then our growth plates are uh, closed. And so we can see uh, here's a boy of eight years of age um, and a boy of 14 years of age. And these are the growth plates that we're looking at in here. And you can see that, uh, hopefully you can see from there, that the growth plates, you really can't see them as much anymore. Um, girls tend to go into puberty a little bit sooner than guys, and so their, their growth usually is completed prior to, to boys. Uh, boys at around the age of uh, uh, 16, 98% of their height has already been attained, and you can see the growth chart kind of leveling out for a little bit at uh, 15 and a half to 16 years of age. Uh, for a girl around 14 years of age is when 98% of the height is already attained, so they end up slowing down their growth around that time too. Uh, that does mean that we also have less time to work with growth in terms of uh, treatment or intervention for girls compared to the boys in there. Something too is that uh, when you're calculating a height uh, of what you expect for our children, we use something called a mid-parental height, and what we use uh, there is a parent's height. We take mom's height and dad's height and we average those two together. So, uh, but we just need to keep everyone on the same growth chart. So if we're talking about a boy, what we need to do is we need to place mom and we place her on a boy's growth chart. And by doing that, what we just uh, need to do is just add five inches. So if we went back and saw these growth charts in here, if you looked around the 50th percentile, five, nine, five, 10 roughly is the 50th percentile for a man, five, 
four or five fives for a girl or a, for an adult woman at the 50th percentile, again, about a five inch difference. And so then if you were to, um, to do that, then you add five inches to mom's height, average her with dad's height, and then we'd have that um, plus or minus two inches as a predicted height for a boy. For a girl, then what you would do is you would subtract five inches from dad's height to place him on a girl's growth chart. And then um, you'd end up then averaging that height, that corrected height uh, with, um, with mom's height and then coming up with a, what we call as a mid-parental height uh, there. So if we had a mid-parental height at the 25th percentile, uh, then if we were to see where somebody was plotting and we found out they were um, at around the 5th percentile, if their bones look like they looked a bit younger, so that's why I titled this as bone age, as their age of their bones, then we would actually have a little bit more time to grow. So the x-ray of the hand is important for assessing time to grow. So whenever you're assessing somebody for their growth, it's good to know where they're plotting on a growth chart, where they're supposed to be, but then also where they are in terms of their of their um, bones or really how much time we have left to grow. So it's almost like if you said, just, we just need a little bit more time, we would get there. If we, if we looked at an x-ray of the bones, we found that the bones looked delayed, we would probably have a little bit of that extra time there. So uh, I, this just illustrates the delay that we have with the bones. And that's why with that other girl that was that case report from just this within this last year, with having early puberty, she probably had a little bit less time to grow and probably more significant uh, impact on her growth. So other factors influencing growth, a lot of things that, and like we say, oh, you are what you eat. Okay, before I get into this, I'll say, yep. Okay, okay, so, and this, oh, this is, this is a great thing to bring up, okay, so, hand x-rays is, is there a certain age when you would do that, you would, you would, Look into that uh, or do a, a bone age when you're assessing the growth. So whatever time you're assessing growth. However, this is the little caveat there, is that we, if you're looking at the growth plates, you don't have many growth plates to look at under age like two. And so because of that, then if we were to order a bone age and put the order in right here into the computer, then radiology probably wouldn't do a hand. They wouldn't do a hand x-ray. Uh, unless that child was over 18 months. And what they would recommend is a hemiskeletal, okay, and they're not gonna just be really precise and do half the kid. They're probably gonna do like what we do, like the baby gram, which is like the whole kid in there. So a lot of times we'll say, let's just wait a little bit till like after 18 months of age um, to go ahead and do that. So they're ordering this, that. So then we only have the radiation exposure in the hand. It's not much, it's much, 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 much less radiation living on planet Earth for a day. But the thing is, is that if we're really trying to get a better assessment anyway, we're a bit limited in what our interpretation of that x-ray is if it's under 18 months. That hand be, can be helpful though, and we're looking at for hypothyroidism or the duration of hypothyroidism because bone age is influenced by thyroid hormone as well as growth. And so we do see that hypothyroid kids often have a delayed bone age. Uh, and so because of that, that gives you an idea of what significant or how significant that delay uh, or that uh, hypothyroidism is, that low thyroid hormone. So this is another tool or device that we can use with that. So, um, just moving ahead to other things that can affect growth, you know, people say, oh, you are what you eat. And yes, so if we want you know, our kids to be you know, eating healthy foods, well-rounded diet. Uh, often we get questions about you know, dietary supplementation you know, with vitamins. And, and typically if you're having a well-rounded diet, then you may not necessarily, or we, we don't typically recommend uh, uh, um, vitamin uh, supplementation with that. Um, and um, it's always fun, we, I, we mentioned that my wife's a dietitian over children's. It's always an interesting experience in the grocery store or wherever I'm at <laughs> with her. And we were just in Costco over the weekend and she's like, oh, Tommy, come here, come here, come here. Look at this, these are Costco multivitamins. Uh, they're supposed to be all complete. I'm just pointing out to you for your patients, there's no calcium in here and there's no vitamin B, I think this. And she said, and that's less than the RDA, what we recommend, and this one is also not having that. 
So it's completely, oh, there's, there's no vitamin D in there also too. So it's just, so just as an aside. So you've really got to look at what, you, what you're actually having, even if you were uh, looking at supplementation. Um, a lot of times when I'm talking to my families, I'll bring up with the kids, I'll say, you know, if you were going to make more of this building, you know, what would you need? You know, you just can't just do cement or carpet, right? You need to have more windows and metal and, and uh, or glass and metal and carpets, a lot of other things to, uh, or basically the translation would be like a well-rounded diet to make more of this healthy building. So I said that one time to this one patient, I said, what would you need to make more of this building? And she looked at me and she said, money? <laughs> and I said, yes. And then what would you buy? So we got back on track, but, but it's just, it's important with that. And we do, we do see that um, with um, a lot of our patients, uh, there might be problems with feeding initially, and that could be affecting our initial growth with it. And, uh, and, and for that reason, that's really why it's so important to really understand what the limitations are from like a bone age at a young age uh, that it may not necessarily be all that all that helpful and um, and even with uh, some babies with uh, severe reflux that cannot be managed uh, then it might actually uh, this kind of is more of a leaning toward uh, GI talk here but just looking at different other interventions that can help with um, getting calories in and so that can help uh, potentiate growth even in those with growth hormone deficiency, if we don't get enough calories in, those kids won't grow. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, we really need to make sure that we get enough calories in for that. When I was at, um, I did my fellowship over at Yale and there was this, there was this uh, endocrinologist there that used to pinch all of his patients. <laughs> you know, if he couldn't pinch an inch, you know, with it, and these kids would be like always like running away from Scott every time we went into their room, and and so I asked them, I asked the kids sometimes, I said, you know, how hard does he pinch you? And they're like, oh, really hard, and they all wanted to show me, and they were all willing to show me a heart. So I asked Scott one time, I said, are you really pinching that hard? And he did. So, <laughs> you know, but but just really making sure that you know you can pinch it, really making sure you get the calories in, well-rounded diet, um, half the plate is vegetables. Really look at the amount of food uh, that we're having in there. Um, and then the other is, is with sleep. We do release more growth hormone at night than during the day. Yes, do you have a? I, I oh, do. Yes. I just want to see how it turns on. Oh, I, I probably, okay. okay. No, no, I guess. I'll talk loud. Um, or come up here, you come up here. No, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Go back one slide. Yep. Oops, sorry. Okay, I think, yeah, we're mm -hmm. up. Um, I have something to add. Yes. Kevin was born low birth weight, mm -hmm. full term, but he didn't, uh, he wasn't capable of swallowing. It all drooled out. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that he didn't have the muscle tone. So they did the temporary solution of an NG tube. Right. They never went any farther. It took five months before I was able to get a pediatric GI doctor to look at him where he wasn't growing. He was just failing and barely maintaining this skeleton with skin hanging on him. And uh, the doctor ended up doing a scope mm -hmm. and he had a thick she didn't even see it, but what had happened was when they scoped him, it opened up the esophagus that had been almost blocked off, except for what the little tiny NG tube that poked through there was able to open. He, he had reflux, which almost caused him to die because it cut off his um, airway. Mm. And so we were doing emergency room runs and everything. So I think what I, I want to get across is the fact that don't let them just blow it off when there is a problem in the NIC unit for feeding, that that's something, that's an indication. Something may be more severely wrong than what they're thinking. Um, because he's alive today, 
because a, a GI pediatric doctor actually listened to me mm. and spoke to him, which opened it up. When he came out from anesthetic, it was the first time in five months he completely sucked three ounces of fluid and swallowed every drop of it. Up until then, we were filling up cloth diapers with all the drool. So just to add that, so people don't think that they know it all, if you're concerned, please say something and stay, plant your feet. Yeah, yeah, and just, and, and, and just, and this is a little depressing thought here, but you probably know a lot more about Jacobson syndrome than a lot of the pediatricians or a lot of the other doctors out there. So just really being, and I don't need to say this, being really like an advocate for your child. And so that's really with all these talks that we're doing, just to really make sure that you plant your feet and you, and you just say, no, we just really, and I think that it, it, it's important in any circumstance, if something isn't, doesn't feel right, for us as parents to get an explanation of why something is happening, why something is not working, why are we drooling, why can't we swallow? You know, what step do we do? Because sometimes then it puts that position or that physician in that position where they, they really need to come up with an answer for you. And if they don't know, they're like, hey, you know, I don't know. But then what's the next step from there to really kind of guide it in a good, in a good way uh, so that you really can get the best, you know, care and, and we can take care of our kids. Um, which kind of brings me up to this other thing. A lot of times when I talk about kids, or to the kids about growing. It's like, is there anything I can do to help grow? A lot of times, like sometimes the teenagers say, what can I do, you know, with that? And I always just sound like a dad. You know, I say, well, you need to go to bed on time. You need to eat, you need to exercise and get out of the house and off the computer, you know, with it. And it's just, they all sound like these dad things. But actually, when we did growth hormone stimulation studies in the past, now we use chemical stimulants to, uh, cause a release of growth hormone to measure that hormone level to see if we're deficient or not. But prior to that, which wasn't actually that long ago, in the late 90s, is when we would, would um, use other means. At nighttime, you release more growth hormone than during the day. We'd have kids admit it over the night and measure their growth hormone levels. Exercise causes you to release more growth hormone. Um, I had this one kid that, um, this was, I, I did my training on the East Coast, and, and we asked them, this kid, we'd have this little track in the hospital. You have to follow these little arrows in there and say, run around the hospital and come on back for your blood draw, you know? And it was at night and running with exercise and, uh, and uh, with that. So uh, <laughs> they, uh, uh, we, we, we lost him. We didn't know where he went. He was gone forever. And then he comes in drenched, freezing cold during the winter time in New York. And, um, and he ran around the hospital and came back. So he didn't follow the trail. He came in and he was like, I'm freezing. I need to get my blood drawn. And we, I mean, he was so clamped down. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, with that. So, so exercise does increase that. What we eat, it does increase or influence our growth. Remember, like with Scott pinching an inch, we do see the hormone levels significantly drop in those that are undernourished. Uh, celiac disease has a profound effect on uh, growth hormone um, uh, levels uh, in our bodies and also growth and and celiac disease is not all that uncommon you know anywhere from one to 250 people maybe one in 300 some studies one in three 400 regardless it's it's that um, it's not very uncommon and uh, and if we're having a problem absorbing our calories then it really can influence growth and sleep also too and the different studies looking at sleep and um, and we in other years we've talked about sleep here uh, with with our kids um, and um, in, in some um, kids they really have a problem with moderate sleep problems or severe sleep problems and that can influence growth hormone levels and we do see that documented with other um, individuals with sleep problems uh, with growth hormone uh, levels um, and uh, so frequent nighttime waking early um, uh, or difficulty falling asleep all can be associated um, with um, growth hormone levels and um, this is just some other additional information to have in there and these all these slides I ain't be able to give you guys all in here so I know that I'm not reading all these word for word in here with that um, and then of course other things just other more general things you know just you know 
there's scoliosis. You know, if I was standing and I had scoliosis, I would be a little bit smaller than what I was in there with it. Um, also, uh, if there is a, a, a problem with my bones in terms of my, my spine compared to my legs, there's ways that we can assess that. If you think of like the Da Vinci guy, our arms are gonna be about equal to our height. And so, um, and the upper half of our body is typically about the equal to the lower half of our body. So we can measure these anthropomorphic measurements um, and, uh, and assess our kids in that way. Um, so these are just, uh, just describing that with the different measurements that we do. And then also really just having good technique. Um, and that's something that um, when I'm working in, um, in, in some offices, I, I can see that the technique isn't quite there, you know, with these like uh, some of the kids where I have to, have to do a remeasurement and find out their height is completely different from what it was measured uh, when they first uh, were triaged or come in um, to the to the exam room. And also like the birthday plot, you know, oh, Joey, how old are you? Well, I'm nine. Okay, well, the kid's going to be 10 tomorrow, but they plot at nine, you know, and then they're like, oh, okay, you know, with that. Um, and then also just, you know, uh, really making sure, you know, that the device they're using, the floppy arm can sometimes, you know, with that, um, sometimes, uh, I had a kid that had, um, his hair was sticking up this high uh, just about two weeks ago, and nobody wanted to crush his head, you know, or his hair, you know, with it. So he was like, oh, I don't want to mess it up, you know. So they were trying to remeasure him in this way and everything, and so we just want to make sure that we get to get accurate reads uh, with our kids. And one height measurement is not as helpful as looking at a trend. So really looking at all of these measurements. And if you do see that uh, things are different in terms of percentiles than where they had been, to really call that to the attention of the pediatrician say, why are we a decreased percentile with that? And sometimes you have to look kind of carefully because if it's a paper chart, sometimes they'll circle it and one circle might be larger than another circle and it might look like the kid is, um, doing quite well, but actually they're decreasing percentiles. There was this one study where uh, they were looking at the number, the size of these circles, and perhaps it was a subconscious thing, or I don't know exactly why, but it did seem that if people were moving or crossing or decreasing percentiles, the circles kind of got bigger, so it, from a distance it looked like the growth chart was, the kid was doing well, but when you looked at the individual points, they were falling farther below. So just really looking at those growth charts carefully with them. You can also, when you do look at the growth charts, see that the growth rate does slow down quite a bit um, right around the time of puberty. Um, and so if you have somebody that just about a year or two before the, the onset of puberty um, and you say, oh my gosh, you know, we're not really growing all that well, um, that's normal. And it's a little bit more uh, profound in boys and in girls, but in both uh, kids, um, the growth can be, um, can slow down there, and actually, I can probably show you a growth chart in here, and you could just, you could just see in here it does kind of bulge down a little bit. This one isn't the best. Pour it in there, so you can see. See, we kind of dip down a little bit in here for both girls and boys in there with that. So, so just a way of just really looking at those at those growth charts just a little more carefully. Where we go? Can't believe I just went through the hole. Sorry about that. So this is just that high prediction. I wanted to make sure it was in your slide set that you guys can always you know, get electronically uh, from me in here. And in terms of other assessments, a lot of times we look at the labs. And if we're looking at the labs, uh, there are certain labs that we'll look at uh, for growth, uh, some very specific for hormones and some not. You're and, on the uh, screen, so. Oh, Let me help sorry about that. Oh, here, it's easy. Okay. Oh, you do? Let's go to slideshow. Okay, you're back. Good, perfect. So, um, so some of them are going to be more general, like complete blood counts if we had anemia or a uh, problem uh, with our, our blood counts. And this could also include even like if we were stressed from, from low platelet counts, then that could also influence growth. Um, celiac screen, I mentioned that. Um, as well as just looking at liver function, that's where growth hormones are made, uh, coming down from the pituitary, going down to the liver. Uh, these growth factors, IGF-1 and a carrier protein, IGF-PP3, are made there. Um, random growth hormone is not helpful with that. It's released in pulses. You never know. You can catch it at a higher or low. So um, the reference range actually for growth hormone is like 0 to 14 in most labs. 
So that means that the level could be zero and the doctor could say, we're normal, you know, it's like, really? So how low can you go? So, um, so because of that, then, you know, you really want to look at that carefully. And so that's why we look at the surrogate markers, the IGF-1, IGF-BB-3. And then of course the, the, the thyroid levels, which is the TSH and the free T4. So those are just some helpful areas that we can look at growth and then look at our kids in terms of their pubertal development and as well as thyroid, which are the more common things that we do see um, for endocrine problems that we do see uh, with our kids with Jacobson syndrome. Yeah. Are there any known uh, children with JS that did not start puberty until 19 or 20? I would say the, probably the answer to that would be yes. And the reason why I would just say that is because mm -hmm normal things happen normally, and there is a, a good fraction or percentage of the population where that happens, it's something we call constitutional delay or being a late bloomer, you know, where they actually will continue to grow and uh, start puberty a little bit later and develop and uh, continue to grow a little bit later than others. So more than likely, yes. What about um, facial hair? Yeah. It really is baby hair. It comes in where it should be mm -hmm. adult hair but it doesn't leave stubble, it's not, it's just real baby hair. You when, when, we look at, when we look at the hair, whether or not it's uh, hormonally influenced, it, it really is that if it's the hair that isn't gonna be leaving any stubble, yes. then that's really not gonna be a hormone influenced hair follicle. Uh, when that changes, and you can think of also, just like think of like hair in your legs, hair in your arms, if in, you know, with it, and sometimes the kids even have a little bit of hair under the arms with that. Uh, if it's changing to where we actually uh, call these more of the hormone influenced hair developed pubic hair, sometimes we have a little bit of fuzz there, and then but it changes to that more darker, coarser, thicker uh, hair, uh, then that's going to be more of a hormonally influenced um, hair follicle. Yeah. Okay, how about recurrence hair? My little guy, he, when he was 11, he was definitely just a little boy, mm. about 11 and a half, he started growing hair, and just, just, you know, within six months, he went from being a little boy to this fully developed man, and mm -hmm. I went to endocrinologist. Right, right, right. You must have just not noticed, and I said, I changed his diaper. Yeah. No, 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 but we see that, though. It's, so... 11 or 12 years of age is when guys typically will start into puberty. Girls, usually breast development is right around 10 years of age. Um, but uh, the, the rate of maturation, the rate of progression is very variable. Okay. So, um, but we, we so see it. Well, yeah, so but so, so the, what you'd be, or I would be concerned about in that situation is whether the bones were maturing quickly, the growth plates were closing up too quickly, because if that happens, that will limit our time to grow. So the bones, the growth of the bones, the growth plates, that's time to grow. How well you grow during that time is influenced by you know, the hormones and your diet and these other things that we had brought up. So if you don't allow yourself enough time to grow, and that's part of the reason why women tend to be a bit smaller than men, because they have less time to grow. Their growth plates close up sooner than they do for the boys. And so that I would be, so with that sometimes what we do is we, I don't know if they did this, but sometimes we'll do a bone age, or what we'll do is we'll at least look at the progression of the, of the change of the testes. The well, testy size. Been, been, no. <laughs> yeah. The only good thing that came out is he stopped wearing diapers. Yes. You know, so yeah. he started using the bathroom. But so I, think I, I, I felt bad for it because, you know, nobody should grow that fast. Your body wasn't meant. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And we do see that the kids that do have more rapid maturation, even though it could be a normal variant, uh, often they don't reach their growth potential because they don't have as much time to grow. But I think this just underscores that we just as physicians really need to listen to our parents. Well, and I and, think you're right, because at yeah. 12, he basically stopped growing. <coughs> he'll, be, he'll, be, you know, he'll be 15 now, and he hasn't grown very much since. You know, he just, you know. Okay. Yeah, so maybe just look at that. But then that would also be when we had just that other report, we didn't really see much in terms of early or rapid maturation 
uh, so much with Jacobson's and Rajas, and, and uh, but in that case was this brought up, and now this is another. So really, as we're getting more information, as we get more kids uh, to be really uh, uh, looked at more carefully by our pediatricians or our subspecialists to get a better understanding of really uh, JS and also uh, ways that we can intervene, you know, with them. In that situation, we probably wouldn't have been able to do a whole lot with that. Um, so if that makes you feel a little bit better at that, but still, it would be nice if they would have listened to you yeah. a little bit better, you know, a little more. Maybe time for one last question. Okay. Um, my uh, grandson. Yeah. We took him to a growth hormone, and he was 15, almost 16. Mm -hmm. And he took it, and he grew four to five inches. Right. And that's, and, and it's, so it's, that's what you're talking about, that it's sometimes not too late to. Exactly. And what that, um, in that circumstance, probably the bones were delayed a little bit, maybe not, but that's something where you really just need to look at the whole picture. And so you need to really do the assessment and not just write somebody off just because of their age yeah. uh, with that and really, and to be persevering. And that's really why I wanted to bring up a lot of these different little parts to this assessment so that you have at least heard it once here, and then if you have other questions, you can always send me an email or get in touch with me this way too. All right. I think just in the interest of time, we're gonna stop now, but Dr. Kelly has graciously agreed to hang around. Yes. Uh, for the next breakout session that um, Jessica is gonna be leading on puberty and things like that. And I think before that gets set up, if you wanna contact him direct, if you wanna to talk to him face to face, I think he'll be willing to do that. So, yeah, of course. Um, I'll be right away. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.